Hello there. Today, I'd like to talk to you about the fascinating subject of follies. Whimsical or extravagant buildings that don't have any real utility, but are designed simply as a decorative focal point, a romantic fancy, or sometimes even as an expensive joke. This talk is going to be slightly shorter than some of my other videos because I'm going to be away for the next few weeks. So I decided to save time by adapting an article about follies that I previously wrote for a magazine back in the days when I was a journalist. So apologies if this talk isn't quite as long as you're used to. I promise that normal service will be resumed in due course. And meanwhile, I hope you enjoy this exploration of these wonderfully quirky buildings. As usual, there will be a slideshow of images to accompany our subject, but there's no need for you to look at them if you don't want to. If you prefer, you can just settle down, close your eyes and relax, while my voice guides you. So, welcome to the whimsical world of follies. The British landscape is full of surprises. Driving along a Yorkshire road, you might be astonished to see an incongruous pyramid jutting out from the green fields. Or, walking through the Scottish countryside, you might suddenly be surprised by the sight of a building shaped like a pineapple. The pleasure grounds, gardens and country estates of the United Kingdom are scattered with these rather odd structures which are known collectively as follies, buildings that exist with no purpose other than to create a picturesque effect upon the surrounding landscape. Follies can be found all over the world and can date from many different eras, but there's a particularly large concentration of them in the British Isles, and most of them were built during the 18th century. This was the era of the landscape gardener, and designers such as William Kent and Capability Brown were busy reshaping the grounds of English country houses and replacing the strictly formal gardens of the 16th and 17th centuries with more naturalistic and open schemes. They were influenced in their designs by artists such as Claude Lorraine, who painted wide, wild landscapes frequently set off by a fantastical classical temple. And landscape gardeners translated this concept from canvas to reality, with the inclusion of picturesque neoclassical temples in the grounds of their rich and aristocratic patrons. A taste for Gothic revival follies was also created by the poets and novelists of the Romantic movement, who praised the rustic beauty of the natural world, but who also couldn't resist the allure of a brooding tower or a crumbling ruin. All these atmospheric details found their way into the pleasure grounds and parklands of the fashionable world. The ideal landscape park was intended to look natural, but the more idyllic the plan, the more artifice was employed to create it. Fake hills were built up, lakes were dug out, instant woodland was created, and follies were constructed that were designed to appear as though they had been part of the landscape for centuries, even if they had only just been erected. It wasn't long before the term garden folly had become synonymous with any expensive but apparently useless structure that had been built to satisfy the whim of a landowner with too much money and rather eccentric taste. Yet in spite of their associations with vanity and foolishness, follies continued to remain popular, and they still have the power to fascinate us. There's something rather spellbinding about walking through a green pasture or a woodland and discovering a solitary tower or a secluded temple at the end of a winding path. Most follies are built in very precise locations to provide a striking vista or give the best view of the surrounding landscape. And it isn't hard to imagine that, although they were ostensibly built without a purpose, these buildings might have quickly become the favourite haunts of their owners. In fact, 
far from remaining useless, follies were often put to use, as delightful banqueting rooms, tranquil tea pavilions, summer houses, hot houses, or even occasionally as dens for drinking and gambling, that were situated a conveniently safe distance away from the main family house. Other follies are openly and uncompromisingly pointless, but in a way that only adds to their captivating decorative bravado. Let's take a look at a selection of these wonderfully eccentric buildings, some of which can be viewed from open roads or footpaths, some of which are part of historic house estates that are open to the public, and some that are actually holiday cottages that you can rent for a few nights in order to experience your very own moment of folly. Folly 1. The Gothic Temple at Paines Hill The Paines Hill Landscape Garden in Surrey was created by the Honourable Charles Hamilton between 1738 and 1773, and it's a perfect example of an 18th century idealised landscape. There are several rather splendid follies to see in this garden, including an enchanting crystal grotto, a rustic little hermitage, and even a grandiose Turkish tent. However, my favourite Paines Hill folly is the Gothic Temple, an elegant octagonal building that sits on the brow of a hill above the lake, where its white stucco decoration creates a beautiful focal point. Each one of the folly's eight sides features a pointed arch and a quatrefoil roundel. The two must-have features in 18th century Gothic revival architecture, while inside the temple, the petal decorations of the original fan-vaulted roof have been beautifully restored and painted in a glorious colour scheme of red and cream. It's a folly of pure fantasy. However, it was this very aspect of its design that led to a rather stern judgment from the Gothic novelist and politician Horace Walpole. He was one of the chief arbiters of 18th century Gothic revival taste, and in 1761 he wrote, Went again to Mr. Charles Hamilton's at Paynes Hill near Cobham to see the Gothic building and the Roman ruin. The former is taken from Batty Langley's book, which does not contain a single design of true or good Gothic, and is made worse by pendant ornaments in the arches, and by being closed on two sides at bottom, with cheeks that have no relation to Gothic. The whole is an unmeaning edifice. In all Gothic designs, they should be made to imitate something that was of that time, part of a church, a castle, a convent, or a mansion. The Goths never built summer houses or temples in a garden. In spite of this damning verdict, I think the Paines Hill Gothic Temple is a rather pleasing building, even if it is an unmeaning edifice. Folly 2 The Pyramid at Castle Howard Castle Howard, in North Yorkshire, is one of the most striking historic houses to be seen in the British landscape, and its grounds contain several follies, including an obelisk, a mausoleum, and the Temple of the Four Winds. However, the most extraordinary building to be found there is a plain and rather stark-looking pyramid, which seems a trifle out of place among the rolling green hills of the Yorkshire landscape. Castle Howard itself was designed by the eccentric playwright and amateur architect John Vanbrugh, but he was assisted by a professional, Nicholas Hawksmoor, an architect who was responsible for creating many graceful 18th century houses and churches. It was Hawksmoor who designed the pyramid in 1728, and his extraordinary creation sits atop St Anne's Hill, in the parkland of Castle Howard where it rises up 28 feet into the air. True to its ancient Egyptian inspiration, this folly has no windows, and only one very small door, which gives access to a hollow interior. Inside, 
there's a gigantic sculptural bust of Lord William Howard, who died in 1640, and who was the founder of the Carlisle branch of the Howard family, who still own the Castle Howard estate today. Folly 3. The Red House at Painswick. Painswick Rococo Garden is an unusual place, in that it combines elements of naturalistic landscape design with more formal garden elements, such as traditional flower beds, clipped borders, and a delightful maze. Designed by Benjamin Height II in the 1740s, the Painswick Garden is packed full of fabulous follies, including the Eagle House, the Doric Seat, the Gothic Alcove, and the Red House. This latter building is an attractive garden pavilion that was constructed from limestone, then dressed with plaster and painted a deep red colour to make it stand out from the greenery of the garden that surrounds it. The Red House takes the form of an ornate little Rococo cottage with two pointed gables, three tall arched windows that are decorated with stained glass, and a matching arched door frame, into which there's fitted an impressively sturdy, nail-studded wooden door. Unfortunately, this folly, along with all the others in the Painswick Garden, fell into ruin during the 20th century, after the garden was abandoned during the Second World War. Restoration began in the 1970s, and, gradually, the garden was returned to its original plan, thanks to the discovery of a rather fortuitous painting that Benjamin Hyatt commissioned from the painter Thomas Robbins the Elder. He was known for his painstaking depictions of country house estates, and his painting of Painswick showed the original layout of the Rococo grounds in detail, so that the once lost 18th century Rococo garden could be faithfully recreated, follies and all. Folly 4 the Needle's Eye at Wentworth. There are several follies to be found in the grounds of Wentworth Wood House, an enormous and now sadly dilapidated stately home, which is said to be the largest private residence in the United Kingdom. However, the most bizarre and pointless of all the Wentworth follies is the Needle's Eye, a rather narrow and elongated 46-foot-high stone pyramid, which has a gothic arch cut right through its centre. This odd-looking construction is said to have been built in the mid to late 18th century as the result of a bet made by Lord Rockingham, who owned Wentworth at the time. As well as being a wealthy aristocrat, Rockingham was also a successful politician. He was actually Prime Minister of Britain on two separate occasions, between 1765 and 66, and then again in 1782. And he's best remembered today as the Prime Minister who strongly supported and acknowledged American independence. However, in his less statesmanlike moments, Rockingham was also a man who was fond of a drink, fond of horse racing, and fond of placing wages. During one particularly high-spirited evening, it's said that he bet his companions that he could drive a horse and carriage through the eye of a needle. Presumably, the next day, Rockingham realised his folly, but in order to satisfy his honour and win the bet, he decided to convert his boast into an actual folly in the grounds of his estate. So it was that he commissioned the celebrated Palladian architect John Carr to build the needle's eye. And once it was finished, Rockingham drove a horse and carriage through the middle of it, just to prove that he could. Folly 5. The Pineapple at Dunmore One of the most extravagant 18th century follies is the pineapple, which is to be found just outside the small village of Dunmore in Scotland. This structure was originally part of the Dunmore House estate, which is now sadly derelict, and it was built in 1761, upon the order of the 4th Earl of Dunmore. Unusually, the building didn't begin life as a folly, 
but was originally intended for a practical purpose. It was created as a garden hothouse, and the original design was fairly plain and only one story high. However, a few years after it was built, the Earl decided to add a second floor to his hothouse in order to provide accommodation for two gardeners. And then, in 1777, he went one step further and commissioned a third floor for the centre of the building that was to be built in the shape of a large, ornamental pineapple. The Earl's reason for doing this seems to have been in order to create an amusing joke. Between 1770 and 1775, he had been appointed first as the Governor of New York and then as the Governor of Virginia by the British Crown. And during his voyages to and from America, he discovered that the sailors had a custom of placing a pineapple on the gatepost of their house whenever they got home to announce their return to the local community. Deciding that he wanted to do the same, but on a much grander scale, the Earl commissioned the pineapple to announce his return to Dunmore. And today, his architectural joke is still standing for all to see. It's also available for all to stay in, because rather thrillingly, you can actually rent the pineapple as a holiday cottage from the Landmark Trust. Although I've admired this marvellous folly from afar for many years, I've never yet had the opportunity to stay there, but it's certainly on my list of dream holiday destinations. Folly 6. Port Marion in Gwynedd. Port Marion is not merely a folly. It's an entire village of follies that were all constructed under the guiding vision of one eccentric landowner. Sir Clough Williams Ellis was an architect at the beginning of the 20th century, who, after inheriting a small country house, set about creating his own ideal village on the land. It took him 50 years to complete. He was still working on it in his 90th year. But this labour of love was certainly worth the effort. Port Marion is an extraordinary place, a village of pure whimsy, in which every brightly coloured building boasts some extraordinary decorative flourish or ornamental caprice. It's full of domes, towers, pinnacles and statues, which makes walking through it rather like taking a trip into Wonderland. Some of the gorgeously quirky buildings have been open as guest houses ever since the 1920s, and a host of writers and artists have found inspiration in the creative and playful atmosphere at Port Marion, including the architect Frank Lloyd Wright, the actor Ingrid Bergman, the novelist H.G. Wells, and the playwrights Bernard Shaw and Noel Coward. Coward, in fact managed to write an entire play, Blythe Spirit, in just two weeks while he was staying in the village. And it later became famous as the technicolour location of the cult 1960s TV series, The Prisoner. Today, you can visit this fantastical place either for a day or stay on longer for a holiday in one of the Folly Cottages, which I would thoroughly recommend. Wandering around the Shell Grotto, the Piazza, the Rotunda, and all the other wonderful follies that make up this remarkable place is a truly enchanting experience. That concludes our talk on the grandiose and glorious topic of follies, and it's been a pleasure to share this extravagant exploration with you. I hope you can join me again soon for another softly spoken audio adventure. But until then, thank you for your company. Goodbye.